whenever metalcore comes up, I feel like the first argument, sometimes the only argument anyone ever has, is whether metalcore is really metal enough. As if, first of all, there's really a metric to how metal metal can be. And second of all, as if there's some sort of debate, as if it even matters, like we're going to revoke the metalhead card because it's metalcore. We do that to the new metal kids, not the metalcore kids. And we shouldn't do that to the new metal kids at that. And second of all, why is nobody talking about whether metalcore is punk or not. How come that's the conversation that never comes up? Because at the end of the day, if we sit there and do the math, there's actually quite a lot of punk that kind of slips its way in there. We really don't seem to actually question enough how much punk slips into the metal that we hear these days. I know it sounds like I'm troll baiting, but I swear it's a conversation that I really think merits a proper discussion. That said, you're listening to your favorite Silver Vixen and Maverick metal music maven, Geneviève Genepi, and today I want to nitpick on the incestuous relationship between punk and metal, for they are very much same same, but different. Though in a lot of different ways, they are really woven together by like a shared history. They have similar values and origins, both in the counterculture or being the counterculture, if you would. The actual culture and music of punk and metal have very distinct threads. As much as they have been woven together and have a lot in common, there are some really particular bits that belong to one and not to the other, and vice versa. Our rambling and meandering one-sided conversation here today will be, above all else, an exploration of the fabric the two are a part of. Honestly, though, we're probably going to veer a little hard on the metalhead side of things, but I promise to name drop the Ramones at least once. It's in my notes. We'll do it at least once. Because as much as punk and metal, we are frenemies, or better yet, consanguineous siblings born of the same rebel rock roots. The two spawn new bastard subgenres every decade or so. Even despite that, punk and metal are still two distinct spheres. Now, you may or may not really want to hear this because to our modern ears now, 1950s is old-timey music. And I mean, it's pushing on 100 years ago. We're, we're, we're advancing in time here, children. The 80s are a while ago now. That said, the 1950s was an era that birthed absolute musical pioneers, people who were doing things that hadn't been done before in ways that hadn't been done before. They were fighting back against societal norms. And the musicians of this time laid the groundwork for the emergence of rock music in general, but more specifically, punk and metal. Punk and metal take a lot of their rebellion and their unique identities from this era, even if they draw distinctive catalysts from it. Either way, they both call the 1950s mom or dad, p parent, progenitor, whatever. Anyways, there are a couple important icons from the 1950s who were these absolute torchbearers of rock music in general, but of the rebelliousness in particular. We'll go through a couple of them real fast. I'm not aspiring to do a very super historical overview. We're not going to get too in-depth with it. I'm sure you've heard all of this already before, but some of this bears repeating. Now, my first bullet point here, you, you've you seen it coming. I said the 1950s, and you're already wincing because you know I'm going to go there. I know he's gotten more dubious and disputed with time. Bear with me. We'll take three seconds. I've got three bullet points. Blast through the notes, and that'll be that. We'll have said it. Elvis Presley, often hailed as the king of rock and roll. He was rebellion in the 1950s. He was the guy. He's still the easiest aural and visual image one can call to mind when considering the 1950s. You saw him coming the second I said 1950s. You knew I was going to go there. He was very provocative from everything from his dance moves to his controversial performances and, most especially, the music that he was playing. It was not typical or traditional in any sense of the word. If you're looking for some sonic reference for how he might have been an inspiration to rebel movements such as punk and metal, don't look to Blue Blue anything or any of his love songs. Songs like Hound Dog and Jailhouse Rock do a lot more to showcase Elvis's raw primal energy, but they also serve as blueprints for that charismatic stage presence that really went on to become kind of a brilliant hallmark for later punk and metal acts. I mean, there's still people who dress goth ability to this day. It's, it's, it's a vibe. Now, granted, Elvis was in turn drawing on, or debatably even plagiarizing, blues music, 
but he spun it into a sphere, into a, into a world where it became counterculture. It was something new. It was different. And he pushed the envelope just a bit further, enough that future punk and metal acts could pick it up and run with it. If we're going to name Elvis, though, we have to name Chuck Berry. It's a name that you may not be as familiar with, but you really should be. He was a pioneering guitarist. He was all the fiery virtuosic abandon you can imagine, at least for the 1950s. Certainly, we've had uh, some legends who've come since. Chuck Berry is the guy who paved the way for whatever guitar god you worship who has come since. Chuck Berry was high-energy, riff-driven, just absolutely electrifying, and his lyrics were prone to being a little bit more socially charged. And that's kind of an important element. We will jump back to it in a few minutes. Songs you might want to consider would be Johnny Be Good. You would remember that one from Back to the Future, along with Roll Over Beethoven. These are songs that if you listen to them, you can really hear how he was driving more towards a guitar-driven song. There were riffs involved, epic guitar solo, it was really guitar music, as much as it still followed a format that was very radio friendly and involved, you know, singing and performance. This was a guy who really laid the foundation for having that kind of wild guitar god vibe on stage. And every guitar god that comes after is like Thor to Odin. They have to pay homage to this guy. He was one of the first. Quick note on Jerry Lee Lewis. He was a guy who was also really known for his musicality and his virtuosity on the piano. Great Balls of Fire and Whole Lot of Shaking going on. Or absolute anthems. And that anthem vibe was something that came up for the first time in the 1950s and stuck around. It was something that became influential to later punk and metal movements. You do get that anthem vibe, that chanty, sing-along, wild energy. And that was something, again, 1950s definitely is where it started. Jerry Lee Lewis, one of the guys that you should look to if you're looking for where that might have come from. My third to last bullet point for 1950s name drops is going to be Bo Diddley. Kind of a lesser known one, but a pretty important one too. He's also really known for his guitar work. This was a different kind of guitar work though. This wasn't that wild virtuosic guitar hero abandon that we hear from Chuck Berry. Bo Diddley was a little bit more innovative. He was more about rhythmic experience and experimentation. And that was really what set him apart as kind of something new and something different in the 1950s, but also something that slayed a groundwork, that laid a foundation, if you would, for future heavy songs. You don't get chugging and headbanging without tracing it back to Bo Diddley. Take a quick listen to Who Do You Love? It's one of his more popular songs. It, it definitely has that sort of driven vibe. And it's very guitar-oriented again. But again, without being that kind of wild abandon you get from Chuck Berry. I also find it smacks a little bit of a gothic vibe there. But that could just be me. Every time I hear somebody go on about Skulls, I'm like, Oh, cool. That fellow Halloween is all year round person. Yay. Maybe that's just me. That said... Bo Diddley, very important for the rhythmic complexity he introduced into rock music in the 1950s, which definitely went on to help influence metal and punk. Now, while all of these acts are very brilliant and very important, and they all bring elements of unchecked rapture and fervor to their respective instruments, we haven't spoken of my personal favorite yet. See, I am a core millennial, and like most millennials, I carry some gorgeous emotional scars from children's movies that featured content that was just not really age-appropriate. You probably have a few faves in mind yourself. Without even blinking at Princess Bride, I'm talking Nim, All Dogs Go to Heaven, Lion King, Land Before Time, and The Brave Little Toaster, which features a particular growling musical delight played through the animated little radio while the abandoned objects clean the house early on in the film. The song in question is none other than Tutti Frutti by Little Richard. Little Richard was flamboyant and raucous. He wasn't exactly doing the Elvis hip swing, but oh boy, was he a force on stage. He was an absolute trailblazer of riotous performance. Songs like Tutti Frutti and Good Golly Miss Molly not only showcased his rebellious spirit, but they also set a precedent for that energetic and flamboyant stage presence. And all of this is without saying anything of his amazing and groundbreakingly intense vocals. 
I'm telling you, even at a young age, at a time when harsh vocals were only beginning to be a thing, because yes, I am sadly that old, I remember being absolutely entranced by the rich sound of Little Richard, so dramatically unlike the other transatlantic vocals of the Disney darlings of the time. He, he wasn't just performing blues vocals. His phrasings were longer and more sustained. His growl tones held more body than was traditional. He was sitting there and he was belting it out. He was metal before metal was metal. Without a doubt, this guy, very important to everything that came next. Naturally, if we're sitting here talking about original counterculture icons of the 1950s, we necessarily must bring up Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash, with his all-black attire, his rugged dude demeanor, he was a defiant outsider. That was his image, and, his, and it aligned very much with the rock and roll of rebellion ethos of the 1950s, and definitely went on to be an inspiration, for sure, to later later acts. If you check out Folsom Prison Blues and I Walk the Line, you'll hear that anthem of defiance. You'll hear it resonating with countercultural sentiments. His deep resonant voice and that straightforward rhythmic guitar playing really created a sonic signature that really resonated with a diverse audience. He he was the, the black sheep. You couldn't not sort of love that underdog vibe about him. Cash transcended John constraints and he embodied a raw authenticity that for sure was important for later punk and metal movements. Both punk and metal pop up towards the late 1960s, early 1970s to sort of quickly lay a very vague but important context. Historically speaking, you have to keep in mind the late 60s was really a time where the world started moving and shaking. The, the flower power era of the 60s had kind of started to slip away. We were now dealing with big societal issues, things like the civil rights movement, things like the war in Vietnam. There was a lot of questioning going on about societal norms and there were bands that were ready to step up and ask those questions. On the punk side, we have a couple really important ones to name. The first one, and I promised you we'd get there, and here we are, we're here, the Ramones. They are often hailed as absolute pioneers of punk rock. They were very known for their simplicity and rebelliousness. Their music embraced a very stripped down, fast paced style, reminiscent of that raw energy you found in the early early rock and roll rebels of the 1950s. The Clash is another band that was really known for their punk rock music. They were a little bit more politically charged, a little bit more anthem oriented. Their songs really reflected the band's commitment to social commentary and rebellion. Their songs really reflect the band's commitment to social commentary and rebellion. The Sex Pistols also were known for channeling a defiant energy and they were also really known for their chaotic and rebellious performances. They were anti-establishment at their core. Now, if you were paying attention, the key words were simple, stripped down, fast paced and socially conscious. These were the big ticket hashtags, as it were, of the early punk music world. And these aren't reflected quite as much in metal music, at least not, not when it first got started. It definitely comes up in later subgenres where we see punk breed itself into metal music or rebreed in certain cases, but you don't really have it right at the beginning. We'll circle back to that concept for sure when we get around to metalcore itself. But TLDR... These are the threads that really belong to punk and not metal. So let's just keep those in mind. While punk was busy carving its more rebellious path, metal was doing something similar but kind of its own thing. It was its own creative entity. It drew from 1950s blues and rock. It's a bit of a generic way of putting it. Personally, I always found that one of the things that made early metal stand out was how closely it was linked to blues music and blues's passionate love affair with the exploration of musical prowess and a musician's devotion to their craft and to the raw drive to that musicality. But there's probably discussion for another day. The TLDR of it again, basically, metal was drawing from blues and was looking to channel more of the darkness and more of the musicality again of the thing, the virtuosity in the music, really striving to make something of high quality, not just an easy product to record and put on a shelf. Black Sabbath is regarded as the first heavy metal band and I see no reason to contest that. And they were very influenced by blues and rock of the 1950s. 
they really laid the foundation for what was to become metal, especially with their first album, Black Sabbath. But obviously, Paranoid would go on to really be the manifesto on metal. It's everything you could want with the aching drones of the guitar, the driving rhythm, and Ozzy's mournful vocals and dark lyrics, not to mention the band's overall goth-adjacent look and distinct ethereal vibe. I mean, I think we can pretty much agree they wrote the book. They are all the dark, droning, chugging, and brooding you could ever want in a metal act. They were the ones that did it first, and in some ways, they're still one of the best. Led Zeppelin is not always regarded as an exclusively metal band, which in my opinion is an absolute heinous crime. They very much drew on those same blues and rock elements of the 1950s. If you look at Whole Lot of Love and Immigrant Song, you can really hear the intense musicianship that went into their music. You can hear that they were not doing the flower power thing. They were doing something bigger, bolder, angrier, more experimental. And especially if you look to Immigrant Song, you can actually really hear that experimental vibe vocally. Those wild shrieks are definitely a precursor to some much more intense vocals that would come up later on. Honestly, between the experimental vocals, the superior guitar-driven music, and the, the music that it was itself, far more complex than the average rock song, I really think it's a crime to not consider Led Zeppelin as an early metal act. Deep Purple is an other influential metal act. They were a little bit more on the rhythmic side of the whole affair. Again, a little bit kind of that Bo Diddley vibe. And they were very bluesy, very dark, very driven though in sound. If you check out Smoke on the Water and Highway Star, two absolute classics, you can hear that blues infusion, but you can also hear that drive, that rhythmic intensity. They were definitely known for a heavier sound, and without contest, they're definitely considered an early metal act. Two other names that I necessarily must drop because they definitely were early metal acts, though not as early as the first three, would be Judas Priest. They popped up shortly afterwards and embraced that rebellious rock and roll sound. Breaking the Law and Hellbet for Leather really exemplify that energetic drive, that <laughs> outlaw rebel sound that they had and they were very much darker and more intense than what you were hearing from your average rock band the other mention that i would put out there would be motorhead again not one of the first first but definitely one of the earlier metal bands to pop up there and they were a delicious bridge between punk and metal they really contributed to the vibe of both if you listen to eights of spades and overkill you really get that that vibe of not only the a speed and aggression of punk, but you also get that heaviness and that darkness that's a little bit more metal. They were very much an influence to both. Now, I've obviously forgotten to mention one of the most important acts of the late 60s and early 70s. Alice Cooper, often referred to as the godfather of shock rock, occupies a unique position in the landscape of early punk and metal. He emerged in the late 60s really became a thing in the early 70s, and he brought a lot of theatrical and rebellious edge to his music and stage persona that definitely resonated with later acts. Musically, Alice Cooper's work really featured a variety of different elements, most notably that hard rock, call it punk, call it metal, probably depends on the song, as well as some glam and proto-punk influences. He was punk before punk was punk. He had hard-hitting, riff-driven songs, and he had, again, that theatricality and often very dark lyrical themes. He, he was very metal, but at the same time had that angsty teenage drama vibe that really came off a little bit more punk. If you listen to one of his tracks like I'm 18 from Love It to Death, you get a little bit more of that disenchanted youth vibe. It's really an anthem, a call to action. It's raw, straightforward lyrics and it's energetic delivery really capture the frustration of young people searching for their identity. It was really a precursor for punk music. That said, metal kind of also had some things to draw from that album. If you look at the ballad of Dwight Fry, the song's theatrical and dark narrative really kind of explored different themes of insanity and alienation, and it really showcased Alice Cooper's ability to create this chilling atmosphere with the music and the lyrics. It was very uh, welcome to my nightmare, if you would. The song's impact on the, on the new up-and-coming metal scene was significant. It really showcased 
darker and more complex lyrical content. It had the dramatic shifts in intensity, and it had Cooper's haunting vocal delivery, which really brought, again, that theatricality and that drama to the music. Under My Wheels is from... Under My Wheels from the album Killer. Also very powerful guitar riffs and very energetic, fast pace. Very often cited as proto-punk. It's got that anthem vibe. Inversely, on the same album, you have Halo of Flies. And this one was a co complex, multi-part composition that really showcased Cooper's progressive and experimental side. Again, that's a little bit more on the metal side of things. That musical versatility, which incorporated intricate arrangements and diverse musical elements. It was progressive, intricate. That musical versatility really went a long way to contributing to the growing interest in more complex and ambitious compositions within the metal scene. So basically, this, to summarize... Alice Cooper himself was really one of those first nebulous acts to kind of straddle the line between punk and metal. He was amorphic and absolutely ambivalent, and he really brought both the simple and fiery cry of the punk kids, while also offering the musical complexity and Nietzschean void contemplating darkness the metal world was trying to develop at the time. Now, none of this is wildly new information. If you have any interest in the origins on metal music, you've heard some variation of this historical breakdown before. I repeat it, despite the risk of boring us all to a premature and benign death, because it bears repeating. This is square zero, and I can't wax and wane and waddle to any kind of conclusion if I don't build from it accordingly. So before I drag you kicking and screaming to more pensive and contemplative considerations, I would really love to take just like a quick moment to sort of look at the philosophical differences between punk and metal thus far. We've kind of looked a little bit at the broader strokes of the thing. This band did this, this, then, this band did that. I'd say we looked at which band came from where, but actually we haven't even been mentioning who's American, who's British, and whatnot, and all of that. Really, we've looked at the kind of the bare minimum of the thing. But the differences between punk and metal actually go a little bit further even than the music. Again, we've touched on it very briefly, but there are some pretty notable there are some pretty notable social and cultural norm differences between the two camps. We do again have them both as responses to the perceived excess and stagnation of mainstream rock. But punk was a bit more subversive at its core. It was really looking to really reject absolutely the virtuosic tendencies of rock. It was going again for that raw, stripped down vibe and sound. Their punk songs tend, tended, tend, still tend to be short, fast paced. They tend to use really simple chord progressions and have always used very aggressive and unpolished vocals. That's not something that really dates back to the origins of metal. If you look back to the original metal acts of the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s up until a certain point that we're going to get to in just a quick second, you don't really hear that much in the way of harsh vocals. It happened here and there, but by and large, that was a little bit more of a punk item. You're going to fight me on this, but trust me, I'm going to we're going to we're going to make it make sense in a second. The DIY ethos was also paramount in punk music and punk culture. They really believed in making music independently, free from the constraints of major record labels. There was this democratization of music production that actually really went a long way to empowering and creating new waves of unconventional voices. So in short, punk was really looking to reject the excess in all things, not just musically, but also, in, again, in the culture. Punk also looked to reject excess in fashion as well. They rejected the aesthetics of disco, the overindulgence of progressive rock, again, the flower power child thing from the 60s. All of that, it wanted to steer clear. Classically, punk fashion really rejected the extravagance of mainstream trends and really leaned towards a utilitarianism style. They favored leather jackets, band t-shirts, skinny jeans. Stop me if you've heard any of this before. Hairstyles were unconventional. They featured mohawks or choppy, unkempt cuts. The iconic all-black attire, which we really kind of get from Johnny Rotten and Susie Sue, although many who've come since have, have sported, but they were, of course, the big icons of the time. 
this this look became iconic for punk's anti-establishment ethos and this was a fashion ethos that was well beyond style it was a visual manifesto that really was trying to challenge those societal norms those mainstream movements that I just named and they were reflecting their own punk movements raw unapologetic attitude lyrically punk was a platform for social political dissent Bands like, we noted, The Clash, The Ramones, The Sex Pistols, The Dead Kennedys, they were using their lyrics to critique authority, to challenge societal norms, and highlight issues such as employment, alienation, and political corruption. You know, stuff we don't worry about these days. Punk's subversive culture wasn't just confined to the stage. It found its heart in grassroots movements and independent publications. Does anyone remember fanzines? Some of you, my fellow elder millennials and Gen Xers, and maybe even boomers might remember these little DIY photocopied pamphlets that used to get passed around in a world that predated social media. Back in the day when a photocopy cost 10 cents. Ha, nothing costs 10 cents anymore. <laughs> so along with fanzines and independent record labels and a whole, there was a whole network of underground venues that really became an essential component of punk's subculture infrastructure. They had this very decentralized approach, which really allowed for a diversity of voices and perspectives, and it really fostered a community and, and a sense of solidarity. It was a very us against them, if you would. Early punk fashion and culture was a radical departure from conventional styles, and it really embodied just a subversive spirit of the movement. Now, a lot of that same origin point applies to metal. Metal was also looking at the excesses of rock music as it had become in the 60s and 70s. It was looking at disco and it was looking at the flower pile children of the 60s and it wasn't having any of that. Metal was no more a fan of the conventional norms than punk was. It was not necessarily out to defy them though, not in the same way that punk was. Rooted more in blues and the hard rock, metal was really characterized again by its heavier sound and its virtuosic instrumentation and that exploration of darker themes, even fantastical ones. We had, I mean, like the first songs with Lord of the Rings ripoffs. We had gothic and ghostly lore and imagery, not just on album covers, but in lyrics. And we had powerful and technically amazing instrumentation. Metal was big and bold and intense. This was no decaf drip. This was the extra shot, extra hot, double tall, hold my beer, I'm grabbing the whip. This was the stuff. You see, already out of the gate, there's a stark contrast in what punk and metal were doing, despite their shared common ground in that they were striving to be counterculture movements, rejecting the prevailing norms. Punk wanted to run off and start a riot with four chords and a desire to scream. Metal wanted to be sure that the music meant something and had substance and it wasn't just a product being panhandled blindly to the masses for consumption. Again, same, same, but different. Philosophically, early metal was a departure from the idealism and utopian aspirations of the 60s. Instead, it wanted to delve into themes of fantasy and mysticism. Mysticism. One more time. Surely this time we can get it. Mysticism. Mm. Mysticism. Mm. So, fantasy and macabre. Pretend I only had two bullet points there. Anyways, if you look at bands like Black Sabbath, they really brought that foreboding atmosphere into their music. They were willing to go draw inspiration from horror movie aesthetics and occult symbolism. And this darker perspective really resonated with audiences seeking an alternative to the peace and love narratives of the previous decade. And even disco had a certain peace and love and color child vibe to it. This was something else, something different, something more, something more grounded and substantial. Musically, again, early bands like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath were very guitar driven and they were known for having those complex guitar souls, very intricate drumming and high energy performances. It was very virtuosic stuff. And the virtuosity of the musicians of those bands really helped elevate the genre to new heights. They were responsible for emphasizing the technical prowess and pushing boundaries of sonic experimentation within the genre. Metal's culture was also characterized by a very distinctive visual aesthetic. Album covers in particular featured often very fantastical and very ominous artwork, and that really set the tone for the music within the album. There was a lot of imagery of medieval fantasy, sci-fi, there was a lot of occult symbolism, and this all became synonymous with metal culture. 
This visual component, coupled with the theatricality of live performances, created a sense of escapism, and it created a shared, created a shared experience among fans. The subculture surrounding early metal was also a tight-knit community. Concerts were very communal gatherings where you could go and experience the sonic onslaught and visual spectacle. It's very much something that still fortunately exists to this day. The emergence of metal festivals and dedicated publications really helped further a solidified sense of community among metalheads. And it really helped provide a platform for the exchange of ideas and the celebration of a shared identity. So, long and short of it, metal music was trying to steer clear of the music as a product void and fill it with something else, something heavier of more substance and meaning. So that said, as much as punk and metal began as two separate and distinct musical and cultural styles, they not only share roots, but they actually come together and weave together to create new styles or bastard subgenres, as I may have said earlier, as we kind of go through history. And the first place we're going to look now that we've cleared the 50s, the 60s and the 70s is, you guessed it, the 80s. What a good decade that one was. It was the decade where there was quite a musical revolution in terms of actual heavy metal and we're not talking about glam metal although I do love me some Def Leppard mmm sugar no no I'm talking about the rise of thrash metal thrash emerged as a ferocious and high energy subgenre it drew influences both from punk and traditional metal styles it was rooted deeply in that rebellious ethos of punk but it also kept borrowing the technical intricacies of metal, and it really resulted in a genre that was faster, more aggressive, but altogether distinct. Punk and metal, which would be seemingly disparate genres if you believe anything that I've been rambling about for the last couple of minutes, really came and fused into a new subgenre, a new genre to itself, and they fueled the emergence of thrash music in the 80s. Punk's DIY ethic, raw energy, and anti-establishment attitude really laced itself into the metal music to really help create thrash as we know it. Thrash inherited punk's rejection of musical excess, where traditional metal had often indulged in intricate and lengthy solos and complex arrangements thrash opted for a much more straightforward but aggressive approach. They had that punk stripped down sound which is a reaction against that perceived overindulgence of the 70s and 80s since apparently now metal was also was also overindulging in sound and otherwise self-glorifying arrangements which hey maybe they were we could debate it the speed and intensity of punk were catalysts for the velocity and aggression that defined, defined thrash. You have that rapid fire three chord kind of structure and the frenetic pace of punk drumming that really gets sucked into thrash music. That really helped thrash push the tempo boundaries. The acceleration of musical elements became such a signature of thrash and it's really exemplified by the big four. That is Anthrax, Slayer, Metallica, and Megadeth. Moreover, you really see punk's emphasis on social and political critique that finds its way into thrash lyrics. And thrash often delved into darker and more fantastical themes than traditional punk, but there's still an inclination for addressing societal issues. You have bands like Anthrax, for instance, which incorporate elements of social commentary in their lyrics, and they were echoing the punk tradition of using music as a platform for dissent. They would also go on to be a pretty crucial building block for new metal, but that's definitely a whole conversation for another day. We'd have to do an intro to rap, and calling the MC God that is Chuck D and I'm watching the recording time tick on and I'm telling you I don't have time for that incantation right now another day thrash metal was not a mere extension of punk even though it favored a stripped down approach it didn't slack on the virtuosic elements and its desire to provide a musical buffet of substance and weight the twin guitar assault which was characteristic of many traditional metal bands was also still embraced by thrash acts with precise riffing and harmonized leads becoming an absolute staple of the genre and most subgenres that have come since Thrash metal's rhythmic intensity really owed a lot to metal's evolved drumming styles. Influenced by precise and powerful drumming in traditional metal, thrash drummers introduced rapid double bass pedal patterns and intricate frills. And intricate fills. This heightened rhythmic complexity set thrash apart from punk's more straightforward drumming approach. Songs where you can really hear that 
fusion of punk's influence with that traditional metal virtuosity include classics like Slayer's Angel of Death, Megadeth's Peace Cells. Oh, it's such a great title in and of itself. And you can also look at Anthrax's I Am The Law for some examples of that socially conscious vibe. Although it also feels a little bit like one of those sporty little crossover cars. It's bulky, but with a peppy, responsive taste for speed if you go looking for it. <laughs> I would also throw out Exodus's Strike of the Beast as an example of fast-paced and aggressive anti-authoritarianism, along with Dark Angel's Darkness Descends if you're really looking for that rapid tempo and chaos vibe. All great classics. Of course, my personal favorite, Testament. You have to sit down and have a listen to Over the Wall and Disciples of the Watch. You really get that intense driving rhythm, the aggressive riffing, harried punk urgency with some socially conscious lyrics, but it's just at the end of the day, you've got that technical proficiency mixed in with that breakneck speed. It's just delicious. It's just delicious. You can really hear how that metal movement sucked the vivacity and fervor out of the punk rock kids and layered it into the traditional metal framework of virtuosity and passion. Absolutely fabulous. Now, as you probably noticed, I have been throwing out examples here and there that you should definitely go back and have a listen to. And if you want to do that, one thing that you could do is you could check out my playlist on Spotify. It's under Geneviève Genepi's profile. So that's G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E. -E -E. Genepi is G-E-N-E-P-I. Just call me Jen. It's a playlist called the Chatty Metalhead Podcast Playlist. Basically, I'm going to keep this updated every week so that you can hear the different songs that I'm naming in the podcast. I aspire to also have it on YouTube, but alas, the tube is giving me trouble this week. So for this week, you'll only have it on Spotify. I really do recommend you have a listen. This week's playlist especially is it's quite an experience as you if you sit down and you listen to it from the beginning to the end, you really get a vibe for how the music developed through the decades. Even I knew where I was going with this when I put this together and I had all my little bullet points and my little my little research prep work all set out. But even I have to say I really enjoyed having the playlist drag me face first along for the ride as the playlist kind of went through. It's it's a really good experience this one. So I really recommend you have a listen and give me a follow so you can peruse future variations of that weekly playlist. Back to the point, thrash metal's impact on the broader musical landscape cannot be overstated. It absolutely revitalized the metal genre and it really influenced a whole bunch of different extreme metal and alternative metal waves that came after it. To name just a few of the subgenres that came after, we have groove metal, which notably includes Pantera. Technical thrash would be another one. Uh, two bands that really stand out from technical thrash include Watchtower and Voivod. Voivod, a great Canadian band, great Quebec band, as it so happens. Death metal is another one that comes from thrash. That would include death and possessed. You have black and thrash, which notably includes the Jean the Finding Bathory, who in fact later went on to spawn Viking metal. That's another important one. Thrash also spawned crossover thrash and Teutonic thrash like Creator, Destruction, Sodom. You have technical death, which includes bands like Atheist and Cynic. Post thrash, which includes acts like Machine Head. And you have industrial metal, for which I'm going to cite Rammstein. Someone's going to fight me on that one for sure. I guarantee you. Watch. This, however, brings us to the next jump in punk and metal rebreeding. If you look to the late 80s, early 90s, you have subgenres like grindcore and sludge metal. Grindcore came a little bit first. It was a little bit more the late 80s. Gained a bit of prominence in the early 90s. It fused elements of punk, hardcore, and extreme metal. It was characterized by very short song durations, blast beat drumming, and very aggressive, typically harsh vocals. It really takes that metal virtuosity and the speed and power of thrash metal, but re blends it again with another shot of aggression and intensity of punk. Bands like Napon Death and Carcass would be really pivotal bands for this grindcore movement. Sludge metal, inversely, also coming up in the 1980s, but getting a bit more prominence in the 90s, use different elements of doom metal, stoner rock, and hardcore punk. It's more characterized by a slow tempo, 
very heavily distorted guitars and a more raw abrasive sound. If you're looking to have a listen, go uh, check out I Hate God Neurosis. These quintessential sludge metal bands really give you, again, that virtuosity and droning passion of metal music, but with a sense of punk's DIY attitude. And now we get to the most important part, or at least the point of this entire chat that we're having. This is where the aforementioned extreme styles of metal rewove themselves with punk once more and created what is probably one of the most important subgenres in recent decades. It's the style that some metalheads swear by, while others say is just not metal enough. It's decadent, intense, a virtuosic AF, and it's quite aggressive but melodic and catchy. It's modern and spicy, but it's definitely no less heavy and pissed off. We are talking about metalcore. That said, early metalcore, which emerged in the late 90s and gained prominence in the early 2000s, it's a fusion genre that combines elements notably of some of those extreme metal and hardcore punk branches. It's a hybrid style that was a departure from traditional metal and traditional hardcore, and it really forged a unique identity that was characterized again by aggressive guitar riffing, breakdowns coming more from the punk side, and a dynamic interplay between harsh vocals and melodic elements. Instrumentally, early metalcore often featured palm-muted guitar chugging, intricate lead guitar work, and a combination of fast-paced drumming and intense breakdowns. The genre incorporates the technicality and heaviness of metal with the raw energy and urgency of hardcore punk. Oh, and did I mention breakdowns? A few notable examples of early metalcore include My Last Serenade by Killswitch Engage, my Last Serenade really seamlessly blends melodic elements with the gr aggressive guitar riffs and those and that really dynamic vocal delivery. As I Lay Dying will also contributed to the metalcore scene. 94 Hours would be the song that I'll drop for that one. 94 Hours really exemplifies their use of metalcore staples like breakdowns, rapid guitar riffs, and again, that combination of clean and harsh vocals. Also, another really good one, Shadows Falls, The Power of I and I. Again, blends that melodic death metal and metalcore elements together into a wonderful fusion. It has the dueling guitar harmonies, dynamic shifts, and those really powerful vocals. Lastly, but not leastly, another personal favorite. I do seem to leave my favorites for last. I wonder if I should stop doing that. Should I put the favorites first? Hmm. Shouldn't give prejudice. They're all important. Atreyu. <laughs> Atreyu. Bleeding Mascara, it combines clean and harsh vocals, dual guitar harmonies, and breakdowns, of course, highlighting their ability to absolutely weave melody into the aggressive metalcore fabric. Early metalcore laid the foundation for metal's evolution, and it laid the foundation for other, subs other genres that popped up later on. Notable ones would include metallic hardcore or hardcore punk, mathcore, think like the Diligent or Escape Plan. We even have post-metalcore and oh get ready to laugh at me I can never say this one properly and I always sound like a baboon when I do say it gent it's a progressive metalcore one uh, item that I would note from specifically post-metalcore gone with the wind from architects I'd say that's a really good one it really gives you that that post-metalcore vibe that mix of metalcore intensity with atmospheric textures really great piece definitely recommend that as kind of a a dessert, if you would, to the, the listening. The TLDR I want to drive home while we're still nibbling on the notion of modern subgenres of metal, that smack of punk's anti-establishmentarianism, is that while there are overlaps and bands that blur the distinctions between one side and the other, there are some general differences between punk and metal. Both genres, while absolutely distinct and while they've both absolutely contributed to the rich tapestry that is the broader alternative music scene, there's still very much a definitive difference between one from the other. And metalcore in particular, most especially, though it has very generous threads of punk revolt and fervency laid throughout it, it's definitely a subgenre of metal. And now we have to get to a call to action, a universal statement, my opening thoughts onto the world. I have no idea who makes these rules, but apparently you have to finish your podcast that way. I want to go with a recent punk item in recent history. You probably have an idea of what I'm going to mention. And if you guessed Green Day's little Magus lyric swap, you guessed right. I am no baboon. I get it. They have a new album out. They're looking to generate some publicity, get some attention. And look, it worked. 
but it's also just good. I mean, look, I'm like a simple guy, but I gotta tell you, my middle-aged millennial mom heart just melted when I heard they did that. I swear for a minute there, I was a few decades younger, 10 pounds later, I was fitting into skinny jeans that I haven't worn in the time it's taken some of today's 2024 adults to be conceived, learn to walk, go to daycare, hit puberty, graduate high school, and then become legal drinking age. I'd say they bought a house, but no one can afford to do that anymore. Listen, hearing Green Day bring the fire like back in the Bush days, felt like change. It felt like we were all still cool rebels. You can say what you want about the punk kid's simplicity and single-minded drive for subversion. I'll admit it's not a staple in my musical diet, but at the end of the day, while they may not be arpeggiating and waxing poetic with their screams, damn do they bring the fight in ways that metal music doesn't always remember to. They're that guerrilla warfare. They're the resonating riotous rebel. What's the expression? The sibilant surreptition that we need in life. And so, you know, my fellow metalheads, remember that while we're getting toasty, we're not quite dead yet. So, next time you see one of our punk cousins, give them a nod or if you're on the interwebs, give them a like because they're out there in the trenches with us. Same, same, but different.